The New Tech Times, a video magazine for the electronic age. In this edition, computerized weather insurance, a marketing coup for a new high-tech firm. Also, bulletin board democracy takes a stand in Colorado Springs. Later, a profile of the unconventional Capro family. And a look at Dallas, where grocery coupons turn electronic. All this and more in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry. CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group. Electronic Industries Association. Hello, I'm Nicholas Johnson. This week's program offers some interesting choices for all of us to consider as we continue our journey through these new tech times. We start with what has turned out to be a very successful venture for a New York-based company involving computers and the weather. Now, many of us tune in local forecasters every day to learn what the weather will be. But for some corporate executives, weather trends are more important than knowledge about today's forecast. Power companies long used weather services as a barometer for emergency crew scheduling. But now, Good Weather Incorporated is using computerized meteorology to help everyone from rock concert promoters to airlines market their products. Here's a report from Minneapolis, produced by Brent Johnson. With Toro's new snow risk program, if it snows less than 20% of average this season, I get all my money back, and I keep the Toro. All your money back? Mm -hmm. And you keep the Toro? Right. Into every winter vacation, a lot of rain may fall. But fly to the sun on Republic, and you get a rain check. Take a Republic sun trip to any... Sun Betting on the weather is risky business. Be it guaranteeing that your vacation won't get rained out, or that we will be getting enough snow to warrant buying a new snow blower. It's a crapshoot, but not for Toro or Republic Airlines. It's Harold Mullen at Good Weather International Insurance of New York who's sticking his neck out. And it's not as risky as you might think thanks to high-speed computers, massive amounts of data, and sophisticated software programs. It's like a computerized farmer's almanac, only taken to the nth degree. I can tell you what the odds are of a hundredth of an inch of rain falling between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. in uh, Duluth on May 16th, um, to what the odds are on a 12-hour day of it raining on 6 out of 12 hours, 7 out of 12 hours, uh, or even having totally 12 out of 12 rain-free hours or rained on hours, what the odds are. They process hundreds of megabytes of weather data, some dating back 100 years, to come up with a particular probability. It takes four seconds by computer compared with 15 minutes by hand. Not only four seconds, but in maybe 15 seconds, we can get 20 or 30 different options. When you stand to lose millions of dollars on the weather, luck helps, but data is what really counts. Weather information is collected, in some cases on an hourly basis, by Good Weather's correspondent computer. It's connected to 7,000 weather stations around the world. Then probabilities and a fee for the risk is figured out. It could be a marketing program for Toro, or ensuring an outdoor rock concert, or movie production. As a marketing tool, which is what, what, what a lot of the business is, it becomes uh, a tiebreaker effect. If there is price parity between two products, such as an airline with, with two lines are charging the same price to a destination, and then there is this added incentive that in case it does rain on your vacation, you might get your money back. Um, you, all of a sudden, it's a flip of the coin. You might as well go with the one that's giving you a little extra benefit. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that's part of it. Plus, um, it, it also can help you in that, in a, in a snowblower, you, if you have no snow, you won't get any use out of it. So you lose use of the product that you bought. But with this program, you would get to keep the product. That's right. Plus get, plus get money, so it even sounds even better. And I really feel it was a real marketing coup for the Toro company. It brought customers into my store, and they bought Toros uh, more than they ever have any time in my history. Final figures aren't in yet, but so far this winter, sales are up for both Toro and Republic, thanks to weather insurance. 
So the 5% the companies paid Goodweather up front for insurance proved far better than having to rebate their snowblowers or discount airline fares 40 to 50% late in the season. And what about Goodweather and all their computerized weather predictions? Did the law of weather averages hold true this winter, or did Mother Nature rain on their parade? Score another one for Harold and the computers. There was plenty of snow for those new snowblowers, and while it was a cool winter in the Sun Belt, it was relatively rain-free. So good weather's loss ratios are going to be good this winter, but it could have been different. Aren't there any sleepless nights, Harold, when you There think? are lots of sleepless nights. There are lots of them. I spend my life at night uh, calling weather stations across the world to see if it's raining on any of my concerts. Or um, As much as the, you can rely on the data, and our loss ratios are good, um, I worry tremendously. Harold can now spend his sleepless nights counting his money. The business has grown threefold in the last couple of years, and he claims to have only begun to explore by computer the marketing potential of ensuring the weather. Harold Mullen uses the computer to provide guaranteed weather forecasts to those who want a marketing advantage. For most of us, I suppose the weather radio or our local forecasters are enough. But computers can be used to provide other advantages. How about a political one? Television networks use them to predict election results. Political parties use them to raise money. Well, David Hughes of Colorado Springs used his computer at the grassroots level to give residents there a political advantage over City Hall. Here's our report, produced by Dale Neitzel. Colorado Springs, nestled dramatically at the base of the Rocky Mountains in central Colorado. It's a city like many in this country, wrestling with change. Here are the traditions of cowboy and prospector, the rural beauty and magnificent scenery seem at odds with a new metropolis of aluminum and glass. The juxtaposition of new and old in Colorado Springs brought the city into the world of computer democracy late last year. City planners proposed revisions of the home occupation ordinance, which drew the notice of one concerned resident. The planning department of the city of Colorado Springs simply wanted to update that ordinance and part of it was because with the recession a lot of people were doing things out of the home that began to interfere with their neighbors repairing cars and backyards their real motive was to essentially to go back to the classical there's businesses here home is here there's never the twain shall meet and a lot of young planners think that way they really aren't looking to the future so there wasn't any intent to stop people using computers or doing home occupations but the laundry list of the prohibited businesses and the fact that the state was made as an ordinance that only one occupation per household and they didn't even define an occupation as a business meant that if the old man wanted to work for Hewlett Packard in his house being a programmer and the wife wanted to sell Amway products and the youngster wrote games for Atari two of them would be illegal if this were an occupation David Hughes is a retired military officer and longtime resident of Colorado Springs. He uses computers to conduct business and stay in touch with friends and associates electronically. David's computers are at home, and he took exception to the proposed home occupation ordinance. I went down, I kept my mind open a little bit. I went down to the planning commission meeting where it was first presented. I was the only person in the city that appeared to, on, before, on behalf or against that item. I read the issue. I stood up to the podium, and I argued high-tech. That kind of stunned the city, the planning commission. They hadn't, weren't thinking of that. I said that in 1978, Alvin Toffler visited Hewlett Packard, Colorado Springs, and in the third wave asked the question, what percent of your workforce can work at home if you chose to organize it? The answer was 35% then. I said it's even going to be greater. All I got out of him was an agreement to table the matter for 30 days. Hugh's interest in this ordinance was transferred to others in Colorado Springs through his electronic bulletin board. It's a computer-based communication system that lets people with home computers impart information on issues and events, leave notes for friends, or just talk electronically with others. Hughes let his fellow residents know what was proposed and how it would affect them. The results were significant. Suddenly, thousands of people in this town had the text in their hands and reacted the same way I did. About that time, the, a lot of them, not me, went to the press and said, why aren't you covering this? They carried transcript printouts from the conversation on the bulletin board, which by this time was 10 to 15 pages of just commentary. Then the press saw, wow, there, this is a populist issue. Lots of people are affected. 
And at the next meeting, 30 days later, later 175 people showed up at the Planning Commission meeting, and it was really beautiful. And what happened is, when that Planning Commission saw that kind of a public outroar, they sent it back to the Planning Commission with guidance to revise it. And we repeated that process over the next four months. Each time it was done, it was on the bulletin board again. Each time it looked, got a little bit better, got to be a more you know, reasonable, because I wasn't about to say we don't need a home occupation ordinance. There needs to be some. At any rate, it finally was passed. The, the, the city council passed it, and so there's now a new enacted ordinance. But electronic populism and electronic political process discussion made sure that ordinance does reflect the future and is an acceptable balance between the rights of neighbors not to be interfered with, people's rights to, to do in their own home, and, you know, and thus, thus the process goes on. Bulletin board democracy paid off for David Hughes and others in the changing community of Colorado Springs, a sign that a city formerly of cowboys and prospectors has learned to cope with the New Tech Times. If you have story ideas, suggestions, or comments about the New Tech Times, get in touch with us electronically. Through the source, log on with Public 125 Direct. On CompuServe, use GoNTT. Or contact us directly through the New Tech Times Electronic Bulletin Board by dialing 608-263-2784. Hughes is now using that Colorado-based bulletin board to stir up the political pot in this presidential election year. Bulletin boards have become useful and popular in these New Tech Times. Our online service lets viewers talk back to their television sets by providing direct electronic access to our producers. But bulletin boards have other uses. There's a new wave of electronic authors that are using them to provide articles, books, and other reading material for home computer users. One such New York-based author is marketing consultant Mike Greenlee. Mr. Greenlee is with us today by satellite from Washington, D.C. Mike Greenlee, welcome to the New Tech Times. I'm glad to be here. Uh, for the benefit of those who don't yet have home computers, uh, are not familiar with telecommunications by computer, uh, what is it that's going on here? What, do you, what are you really doing? What happens is that you use something called a modem, which lets your computer talk over the phone wires to any other computer. And the way you talk is just by using a typewriter and you put those words out onto your computer screen and you're able to receive back the words from a master computer or from some other reader who's also typing in his thoughts. And you would normally have one large mainframe computer that both of you have access to that could be located geographically in a place different from where either one of you may be at the time, is that correct? That's right. In the case of the source, it's in McLean, Virginia. But that really doesn't make any difference to anyone, I guess, because no. you're, you're just using a computer in your own home. That's right. I never think about where it is because I'm more interested in the person that I'm talking to who might be in Vancouver, Canada, or Tel Aviv, or uh, Nevada. What is really new about Participate, the, the program with the source? The thing that's new is that it enables thought to be grouped about a particular topic. Um, for example, it's almost as though there were an electronic conference room and any topic that you want to talk about, whether it's how to bake the perfect apple pie or which computer is the best one for you, you sort of put that topic up on the electronic conference room door and then anybody who wants to can sort of drop in and attend that conference room and hear everybody else and what they have to say in the sharing. But you don't all have to be there at the same time because all you have to do is sign up for all the messages on that topic and then whenever you tune back in again you automatically receive every single note that anybody has left about it and you can always go back and reread them and then you can say whatever you want to say whenever you want and so if you wake up in the middle of the night uh, you can do this at three o'clock in the morning if you want and have yes <laughs> and Mike let's let's get a sense of what's happening here you're in effect a an electronic reporter you are you are covering events as someone with CBS television or the New York Times might. You are filing stories. You're using a lap computer, not unlike the lap computer that a newspaper reporter would use. That's but right. But your stories are going back to the source, where they are available to anyone who pays the fee and has a home computer and a modem and wants to read the stories you've written. Is that correct? That's correct. I want to give you an example. One of the favorite things for me and for some readers that I've done so far 
was to cover the launch of Macintosh by Apple at their shareholders meeting. And that was a big event, and there were lots of press people there. I sat on the second row, and I had my little portable lap computer in my lap, and as Steve Jobs, the president, was talking, I was typing exactly what he was saying. And when something happened on stage, I reported it. Now the screens are coming down. Now we're seeing the commercials, that kind of thing. As soon as the meeting was over, I headed straight for a telephone, because I can send these out over telephone booths, and I sent the reports back so that my readers knew exactly what had happened long before they'd read about it in a newspaper or a magazine or even see it on television. And they had it in depth. They had it fully because of what I had given them was word for word what happened. Do you see this happening in the future? Do you get a sense of, uh, of growth and uh, excitement with this? Well, you know, there really is no question about it. Participate didn't even exist on the source a couple of years ago, and now it's one of the most popular services uh, that the source has. And I think the reason is people are really enjoying this idea of idea exchange about anything that they care about with all kinds of people. It doesn't make any difference that they have to live in your hometown. I foresee also the day when reporters might be commissioned by a particular company or organization or groups of organizations to go out and cover any kind of event. It could be a political event or it could be a technical one and send back particular information that that reporter is able to do and that the paying readership wants to do. Well, Mike Greenlee, you are a, a reporter of the present and of the future and, uh, and an appropriate person to interview on the New Tech Times. We very much appreciate you being with us by satellite uh, for this show. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, the use of computers has increased dramatically in the past few years. There are a lot of companies that are scrambling to get their product into your home and office and once there to provide software to go with it. They use fancy high-intensity marketing campaigns with television or print ads that sell products through a variety of tactics. Names like Apple, Commodore, and Atari have joined IBM, Wang, and Digital as household words. But what about K-Pro? Well, K-Pro is a San Diego-based company that's number four and trying harder in computer sales category. It's run by a family named K that's been called everything from unconventional to outrageous. Here's Tom Tomaszewski's report. Even in Southern California, factories don't assemble products outdoors. At least most factories don't. Few corporate executives in need of warehouse space would elect to erect a circus tent. But the K family has done just that. They are independent, unconventional, and successful. They're in fourth place in the personal computer derby. I try to determine what I ought to be doing and then try to do that rather than what feels good at the moment. At 64, Andrew K. kids that he's never been good at hiring the right managers. So he grew them. Both of his sons are K-Pro vice presidents. This man, Andrew's son David, is K-Pro's vice president of administration. The architects who designed the family's ultra-modern solar-heated home were their daughter Janice and her husband. They designed the corporate headquarters, too. Andrew's wife, Mary, is the corporate secretary, and Andrew says he should always trust her hiring instincts. The music you hear is by daughter Nancy. The sound of her talent fills the air of their Del Mar, California home. This family is doing the best it can. If I find out that it's good to exercise, well, then I try to exercise. If it's good not to overeat, then I try not to overeat. It's good to eat raw foods in preference to cooked food. I eat very little cooked food. If it's good to let people alone at the plant to do their thing, I do it. He's, he's rather practical, but he's sort of, he, he likes to experiment and, you know, he's not so. He, I, I don't think he was brought up to know about business, you know, and uh, he just had to learn the hard way, you know, the hard knocks. <laughs> because he was rather daring, I thought. The family's business daring seems to have attracted consumers. Last year, the computer sales for K-Pro fueled an annual sales increase of nearly 1,300%. Just think, in a matter of two, two and a half years, 11 or 12 companies, were able, micro-computer companies, were able to go public 
that grew so fast. That's a competition. APRO computers are assembled by 12 worker teams. No workplace engineer designates task times. There are no assembly lines. That would make the person, uh, or try to make the person into a robot, for one thing. They do not take full advantage of the little computers that run around on those two feet. Here, workers crank out some 500 KPROs a day. We do that with a team approach, in, in, where we have people being more involved. More of the person is, is involved, and that way you get a lot higher motivational level, to, and, and you can also produce a lot more efficiently. Obviously, a person that's motivated can do 10 times the work of a person that's unmotivated, no matter how structured you have it. The sound of power tools in the background is one sign of KPRO's increased aim at stability in the volatile home computer industry. They're building a 45,000 square foot warehouse to replace the two-year-old circus tent. KPRO is shipping computer packages in French, Spanish, and German overseas. Mitsubishi and KPRO are talking about introducing the Japanese computer company's machine under the American company's name. And KPRO plans to introduce a learning machine, a computer tutor. I think we are uh, a new wave of efficiency in America. We hear about our auto companies not being efficient anymore. You know, producing lesser quality and, and, at, at higher costs. We can't seem to make TVs here anymore. We can't seem to make videotape machines. Well, I think we can make computers here in Salon Beach as efficiently as anywhere in the world. The K family doesn't push. Under 5% of the $75 million worth of business KPRO did last year was spent on advertising. It's just clear to them that their way is a better way. And in the competition for a share in the pool of computer consumer dollars, the Ks are confident they will remain independent, unconventional, and successful. From circus tents to free software, Andrew Kay is making his mark in the world of portable computers, and we'll keep you posted on his progress. A few weeks ago, we reported on another kind of progress from Dallas, computerized billboards. Well, now we've got a look at a new Dallas-based phenomenon Texans are trying out, an electronic coupon machine making its way into supermarkets. Here's our report. You're getting ready for the weekly track to the supermarket. Prospects of a $100 grocery bill have you searching for a few coupons. You leave for the store with a fistful of paper. It's a hassle, but many people believe it's worth the effort to save a few dollars at the checkout counter. Did you get this? Oh, I'm looking for that. No. Drag out those. 22, 18. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. There's another way to clip coupons without using a scissors. It's done through a computer. A company called the Electronic Advertising Network provides terminals for shoppers in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The computer coupon device was designed by businessman Chet Lemon. You clip them out of the newspaper, the people forget them, uh, forget to go to the store with them. And when they get to the store, they immediately say, oh, I forgot my coupons. And uh, once the habit is developed of checking the coupon dispenser, why they know they're readily available. and. Now they are at the point of sale, so it saves them time and uh, saves them money. The coupon machine is activated with the backside of a credit card. It reads the magnetic stripe to identify the person selecting coupons. People who don't believe in plastic money can receive an ID card from electronic advertising. The reason for identification is so food companies are able to control the number of discounts each person receives. The coupon computer can help shoppers to save a few dollars, but it may save a bundle for people who produce the items that are sold in grocery stores. They lose $300 million a year from coupon fraud. Much of it is lost to thieves who set up fictitious stores and hire people to clip coupons, sending them in for redemption without selling any products. That's why manufacturers want controlled distribution. I think in the next uh, uh, three to five years, practically all coupons will be electronically dispensed at the supermarkets and the stores. But it may be difficult to convert from paper to electronics. 
Some shoppers refuse to touch a computer. Lemon claims most shoppers are enthusiastic about his coupon machines. He plans to install them in Denver this summer. He would also like to build a national network. But there are plenty of Texas shoppers left to convince. During 90 minutes at this busy Dallas store, nobody touched the machine. It seems as though there's a generation gap between the people who buy the majority of groceries and those who are accustomed to using new technology. From guaranteed computerized weather predictions to electronic democracy in action, new wave authors like Michael Greenlee to old line businessmen like Andrew Kay. This week's program has been a look at the people who are taking advantage of these new tech times. Next week we'll be back with more reports about people like these. In the next edition of the New Tech Times, Audio Bionics help the deaf talk to the outside world. Also, cruise in California style with microchip car stereos. And cable goes retail at the mall. All this and more in the next edition of the New Tech Times. I hope you'll join us then. For the New Tech Times staff, I'm Nicholas Johnson. Tech Times has been brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, the CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. For a transcript of this program, send $3 to program number 127, the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Or you can now communicate electronically with the New Tech Times. Just call the source or CompuServe and select the New Tech Times online.